ladies and gentlemen, Matt Ellis, JetBrains. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm just hearing that read out to make it sound really old. 20 years shipping software. That's not good. Um, anyway, hi, I'm Matt, and today I'm going to be talking to you about writing allocation-free code in C Sharp. Um, and I like to, it's, it's kind of a bit of a trend lately. You've heard about it a lot probably in lots of the blogs with sort of .NET Core and .NET, um, and the .NET framework and everything. This is uh, something which is a lot of focus on. Uh, so I'm going to have a talk about it. And I like to start this with a little bit of uh, very simple advice. And that's, that's don't. Don't do this. What I'm about to talk about is a whole load of micro-optimizations. And basically, you don't need to do this. So don't worry about this. Except, of course, until you actually do need to do this. Uh, and then it can be very, very useful. Um, but kind of the main message I really, really want to get out of this is make sure you measure. You might want to be, need to do this. You might have to do this to, to get the performance that you want. Um, but please measure to make sure that that is, um, that is what you want to do. And if you take nothing away from this talk, that one is the key one. Measure your code, see what your performance requirements are, and then uh, do whatever you need to do then to, to make it work. OK, so why am I going to talk to you, especially when I've just told you they're not going to do it? Um, I think there are several reasons, really. We've been working in a world of sort of C-sharp and managed languages for a long time now. And we've kind of got used to this idea that managed memory is cheap. And that's not sort of strictly true. Um, allocation is cheap, usually. Um, what is expensive, really, is that garbage collection is expensive. You have to stop the world, pause all your threads, do a lot of work, and clean everything up. And so what I'm really talking about is throughput. So we've got the idea here as well, you know, it's, it's not necessarily how much memory you allocate there, um, but it's you, you, your actual peak memory might be low, but your memory traffic itself might be huge. You might be allocating over time several gigabytes, but you never get above a couple of hundred megabytes. So throughput is the kind of key thing I'm looking at there. And what do I mean by this? Well, if we are talking about more allocations, um, if you have more allocations, that essentially means more garbage collections. And garbage collections then introduce pauses. Pauses disrupt your throughput uh, and um, sort of introduce pauses into your game uh, or your, uh, your product, your application. And uh, if you have uh, better throughput, you essentially have a smoother application. This isn't necessarily faster. This is a key thing to point out as well. You might just have something which is, um, is smoother, a better experience. And this is really good then for um, applications which require some kind of low latency. So things like servers, web services, and so on. Uh, games, obviously, uh, and interactive user interfaces, and things like that. And the interesting thing with that list, really, is that that kind of covers a lot of products. It covers a lot of things. And it's only really then batch processes when you don't really need to worry about this kind of thing. So this kind of thing is very useful to keep an eye on. It might not be that you have to apply these kind of techniques in your own products, but it's definitely something to look out for and watch. Another reason why you might want to look at reducing the amount of allocations you have is because you're working in a constrained environment. So something like uh, writing code for a mobile device, working on a console, perhaps, you know, if you are writing games, uh, working inside containers as well, um, you want to have a sort of a low-level uh, usage of memory. And generally speaking, using less memory is a good thing. You know, write more efficient code, might make things better, especially if you're on a less powerful device, because then your garbage collections might be slower. So reduce the number of garbage collections you have, you're going to get a better experience. Fewer garbage collections, better for battery. And it all comes back to throughput again. So if you have fewer pauses, um, especially if your pauses could take longer, it's going to be a better experience. And again, if we're talking of constrained environments and devices, uh, mobile gaming, for example, it's huge. It's a massive business, and it's very much on .NET. Unity, for example, is a huge .NET. Um, sorry, is a huge uh, provider for mobile games. And the last reason uh, I like to, to say this is um, is all about knowing your platform. So even if you're not using it directly, you're still going to be using these kinds of things. And it's always useful to sort of know what's going on in the abstraction layer below you, so you know what's going on. And performance has really become a key part of the actual platform itself. And you can see this in the design over the last couple of years, really. Um, things like uh, tuples in C Sharp. There was an existing system.tuple type, but they didn't use that. They introduced a new value tuple, which was a value type, because system tuple is a class and uh, requires allocations. ISync enumerator we saw in the last talk there, that's using value task. Value task is a way of, uh, it, again, it's a, a value type uh, to reduce the allocations of tasks in certain scenarios. 
Um, and this is all about working with uh, a weight for each. And then, of course, um, span of T and slicing as well, which is really good and which we'll have a look at uh, in a bit. Now, reducing the allocations, low-hanging fruit, the easy things which we can do to try and uh, reduce some of the allocations we've got. These are kind of like your usual suspects, as it were, and some of the really useful things there uh, you can do, which are very straightforward. Um, object reuse. Don't create new arrays all the time. Don't create new objects all the time. Pull them, reuse them, and uh, reallocate them. So if you're going to be repopulating an array, just clear it out and reuse it. And you can u make use of the allocations you've already made. Uh, string concatenation. We all know not to use string plus string plus string, so use a string builder. Uh, reuse a string builder, pull your string builders, and pre-allocate the lengths if possible. So if you know roughly how long you're going to be uh, at the resulting string, pre-allocate that length. Nice, easy, um, easy, um, easy solutions there. Params is an interesting one. Params kind of introduces the idea of something which is perhaps a little bit of an unexpected allocation. This is something the compiler generates for you that perhaps uh, you're not uh, aware of happening. So, for example, if we see on, um, on the left there, we've got the uh, params method there. It's taking two parameters. By the time it gets compiled into your code on the right, we actually see that the compiler has inserted an allocation for you. You have uh, an allocation of an array. And the compiler's done that for you. What is perhaps more interesting is when you have an empty parameter list. You're not passing any parameters at all. The compiler is still putting in an allocation for you. It allocates an empty array to pass for you. So you're paying a cost even when you're not paying, passing um, parameters in. Except I'm lying to you. In recent versions of the compiler, when you're using targeting uh, newer versions of the framework, the compiler actually uses array.empty. So it, um, it spreads the cost of that allocation across all, uh, all types, uh, and it removes effectively the amount of that allocation. So again, don't believe me. I'm just a guy on a stage. Measure, use your profiler, see what's going on, see what it is that you need to fix, and, um, and work with it from there. So the next item on the list, then, of the things we could um, perhaps look at and take a look at for reducing allocations or surprise allocations is, is boxing. And boxing is when you have a value type, such as an int or a date or a time span, and you want to pass it to a method that takes in, uh, as it's expect expecting a reference type, such as object. Uh, console write line is an example of this. You've got your string format uh, message, and then you've got a number of objects. And uh, passing an integer or a, a value type to those is going to cause it to be boxed. And when you box, this creates a new object on the heap, and that contains a copy of the original value type. And this is important as well because it takes a copy. Any changes you make to that boxed value don't come back to the original value. So you've now got two copies of things. So let's have um, a little bit of a, a step back and a bit of a reminder then about what the difference is between reference types and value types. I've already mentioned this so far. And um, we've got two different types in the type system for .NET. You've got your uh, reference types and your value types. So reference type is, um, is, is the class keyword, whereas value types has got the struct keyword. When you allocate a, a reference type, it gets allocated on the heap, whereas value types are allocated on the stack. This isn't always strictly true because you can have a value type embedded inside a reference type. I could have a reference type which is a, a person, for example, and then I could have a date time in there to represent the, the date of birth. But it's embedded directly in the reference type, and in that case, it's not allocated on the stack. Uh, when we have a, a reference type, a variable for a reference type is a reference to the thing on the heap. Basically, the variable says it's over there on the heap. Whereas when we have a, va a variable for a value type, as the name suggests, it's the value itself. So it is the integer, it is the date, um, it is the time span, or the 3D point, or whatever. When you pass around a reference type, it's passed around by reference. Again, it's just pointing to the object on the heap. Whereas when you pass around a value type, um, it's passed by value. You make a copy of it. It's an, a second instance of that actual value. And what is interesting is, is with assignment as well. When you're assigning uh, references uh, around, you, you make a copy of the reference, not the object. It's still the same object over there on the heap. You've just got two, um, two variables telling you where it is. What perhaps isn't obvious is when you have an assignment of a, a value type to another variable, you're actually making a second copy of that value. It's not the same instance. You've got the second copy, even when you're assigning it to a variable within a method. 
So I've already been start talking about heap and stack. And so what's the difference really with, with heap and stack? They're both ways of allocating memory. But the heap is general purpose memory. Heap allocation is there for the whole application. And it lasts for the lifetime of, that, of the application if, if you don't uh, reduce, clear, it, clear it up first. So uh, if you allocate something, you can allocate it right at the very start of your application, and it can last for the entire lifetime. It doesn't matter what methods you call, what happens, it can, it can still remain live. The stack, however, is a block of memory which is uh, purely used during method calls. And it's, re it's there for data which is required by a method such as local variables. When you enter a method, you push space onto the stack for your local variables. And when the method exits, you pop the stack, you clean everything up, and that data disappears. So stack allocation is for the lifetime of the method, which is really useful to know. If I just said now that value types are the whole data, so if you've got a date time, the value type is the date time, it doesn't point anywhere else, it's the whole data. That means that the, when you have a value type variable on the stack, it lives directly on the stack. The data just lives there. You can also use the stack alloc keyword to uh, create blocks of memory on the stack, but that's not used terribly frequently. Um, but the really interesting thing then is that all both allocation and cleanup on the stack is cheap. So you can easily just pop, push some space on and pop some space off at the end of a method call. So you've got um, limited space, but you've got uh, cheap allocation and cheap cleanup and a known lifetime. All right, back to the list of things that can cause you some uh, allocations within your code. Closures um, are very, very useful. It's a great way of writing code, especially with things like link and so on. But of course, the compiler does a bunch of rewriting behind the scenes to make this happen. And what it does is it captures the local variables as fields on a new class, and it creates a new instance of this class, and calls a method, moves the lambda to live on that class, and, and calls it there. So you've got allocations going on as you capture variables. Link makes this very uh, convenient and uses it a lot. You know, your your uh, where methods, your select methods, and so on, they are very, very useful, and it's a really nice way of writing code. However, it uses a lot of these, um, these closures and, um, to, to pass state around to do the work that it needs to do, so there's allocations of that. But also, when you call a static method like where, you've got an allocation of an, an enumerator class. So there's two allocations going on here. Now, there are tools which you can do to, sort of, uh, to show some of these things there. It was the same with the, the boxing as well. There's a, a plugin for, for Rider and Resharpa called Heap Allocation Viewer. And it will show, it will highlight where these unexpected allocations happen. So it's not just about your uh, allocations for new and so on, but it'll highlight things like boxing. It'll highlight things like uh, capture, capturing of closures uh, and so on. Iterators, the yield return. Um, the, again, the compiler will rewrite all of this there. It introduces a state machine. And uh, there's allocations going on there. If you've got captured, uh, captured state there, again, you can have some allocations going on. Uh, again, heap allocation viewer can show you that. A sync await is a very similar story too. So the, the compiler will rewrite your code into a state machine. It'll allocate the state machine. You've also got the, the sort of uh, mechanisms there to allocate stuff for the task method builder. And then when you return in values as well, you've got uh, task and task of t, which are uh, reference types, and those get allocated too. So you've got quite a few allocations going on there. There's always work to reduce that, but you've got to be aware that there is an overhead here as well. Now, allocations for the task and task of t can be quite expensive for some of the common use cases as well. So if you have a task which basically completes immediately, you're still allocating a reference type to wrap a known value which you've already got. So it's almost like a, a, an unnecessary allocation you've got there, especially things like uh, you can't also reuse it terribly easily as well. Uh, and so you, value task has been introduced. Again, we saw that with iasync uh, enumerable and um, it is a value type then which can represent either a known value or an allocated task. Uh, and it's very, very interesting to see how that's useful. There's a, a really good link there which explains um, when you want to use it, what it does, why it works, and all those kind of things. I'll have some more links at the end of, the, of everything. So those are the kind of, uh, some of the sort of known things which we can uh, look out for and work with and very easily sort of work around those. There's some uh, very easy sort of solutions to some of those. So the params arguments, for example, there uh, introduce overloads, which have got a common number of arguments. So if you know that your method is going to be called frequently with two parameters, create an overload which has got two parameters. Therefore, you can just immediately cut out all those allocations of two parameter arrays. 
if you've got a method which uh, is doing uh, boxing because you're trying to pass value type into an object, um, introduce generic overloads. Let the compiler, let the runtime do the work for you. So instead of, if you've got logging methods, for example, instead of having log, you know, string format, object, 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 make those generic. Introduce a number of um, overloads for those generic uh, operations there so that you can pass in anything and lean on the runtime to do the work for you. Closures, um, the best advice there really is to avoid these in critical paths. If you do need to use it, um, try and store some of the state uh, as, as an argument to the lambda rather than allocating it, um, before, before allocating it into the display class uh, and pass the state as an argument. One thing which is really useful with, with closures as well, though, is to have a look at local functions. Local functions uh, can make this a whole lot nicer because the way that the code is rewritten to capture the variables uses structs and uses value types. And so you could then pass the state around um, without uh, introducing allocations. I, I, I believe this isn't always strictly true, but it's um, a useful thing to have a look at and to investigate. If we're talking link, again, the um, suggestion is to avoid this in a critical path. So in the Resharper code base, for example, we have certain critical paths which we will avoid link on, and we will just uh, drop back down and use for each and if and you know traditional sort of uh, uh, control flow methods there rather than using link. Iterator starts to get a little bit harder to sort of give some advice for. It's like um, perhaps you can return a collection, but you're most likely going to then need to allocate the collection anyway. Um, and perhaps you need to be use the uh, infinite stream type idea of, uh, of an iterator. Um, so it's hard to really sort of uh, give some good advice on that one there. Perhaps the best thing to say is, well, just be aware of the cost. Know that this is going to be uh, allocating there and measure it to see whether it affects you or the way, whether it's a cost that you can live with. Uh, and then for async methods as well, similar sort of thing. Not much you can do. If you want to do something asynchronous, then uh, you, you're going to want to use it. But investigate value task. Read through that, uh, that, that document we've got linked there and see if value tasks can help you and work with you. OK, that's all the uh, known stuff, the simple stuff, and the interesting stuff. This is what I really want to talk about, though. This is it. So reference semantics with value types, which is a little bit of a mouthful. And it's a bit sort of confusing everything. So what does this really mean? What is it all about? So it's a set of features that were introduced in uh, C Sharp 7.0 and 7.2 uh, for working with value types. Uh, and it gives you reference semantics. And it's like, well, OK, fine. But what does that actually mean? Um, well, the idea is, is, is fairly straightforward. If allocating a reference type has a cost, because you've got garbage collection, and garbage collection introduces pauses, uh, but passing it around is cheap because you can pass things by reference. And then you've got allocating a value type, which is cheap, because it's just moving the stack. And cleaning it up is, is cheap, because, again, you're just clearing up the stack. But the passing it around is a, uh, has a cost, because it, you get copies, and you can't modify it, and it's all tricky and everything. Why can't we have both? Why can't we have both? And that's exactly what this is. So reference semantics with value types is about having value types that you can treat like reference types. So you can pass by reference everywhere. You can reduce the amount of allocations you've got, reduce the memory traffic, reduce the number of garbage collections you've got, improve your throughput. And you can pass by reference as well. This avoids the copies. This gives you, um, uh, this gives you instances that you can modify, you can share. You can pass something in, you can modify it, and you can ret return it back. And again, I need to say that these are very low-level optimizations. You will quite possibly never need to use them until you do need to use them and measure and so on and so on. But it's still useful to know this because these are going to be used in the platform. They are used in the platform. And then you know, once they're using the platform, it's like, well, OK, I could use these in games and stuff. Unity is already using some of these features to improve some of the things they're doing to pass uh, value types around so they don't have to allocate so they could be um, used um, without having to cause garbage collection, and so on. It's also useful for things like parsing and serialization. And before you know it, they're going to find more and more uses for it. So it's useful, but it is uh, low-level micro-optimizations. But using them in the platform is really good because you build on top of the platform, and everything that gets built on top of that is going to make use of these. All right, another sort of um, step back and back to basics for a sec there. Pass by reference and pass by value. I've been sort of saying this about a bit, and it's like, what do I mean by this? So 
if you have a reference type, you've got a, a variable to a reference type, it's a reference to the object on the heap. So we've got a variable there. Basically, it's saying the object's over here on the heap. Passing this reference type around, passing it to a method, just passes the reference. So I've got my reference here. I call another method. I've got another reference. It's still saying it's over here on the heap. The caller and the called method see the same object on the heap. It's just this object there. That's passing by reference. Value types, though, if you've got a variable of a value type, it's the value itself. You can't sort of say it's, it's over here because that's not how it works. When you pass it to another method, you get a copy of it. Assigning it to another va uh, a variable, you get another copy of it. And so you end up with multiple copies of these values around. The original value is not modified, uh, uh, but when you call a method, you get another copy. It's important to point out as well, these copies aren't expensive. If you've got, for example, a value type that represents a 3D point, that's just three floats, it's you know, a small block of memory, mem copy, it'll be nice and uh, straightforward to do. But still, less work is still less work, and um, the idea that you can't modify things reduces the, uh, some of the benefits you've got from some of these reference uh, semantics. So, right, let's have a look at the, the first of the building blocks that C-sharp introduces, um, which make it useful to, to use this. So, uh, ref return is a thing. So, what this one allows us to do is to return a reference to a value type, rather than returning a copy of it. So, we've got a value type, and when we return it back, normally you get a copy of the value type. With this feature, you actually get a reference to it. So this changes the actual method signature that you see. It's a bit hard to see sort of in C sharp, but if you look at it in IL, it's pretty obvious. So instead of getting a return value of an int, you'd get a return value of int ampersand. It's saying this is a reference. So this is, this is something different. You're getting a reference to a value type here. This puts a number of constraints on the, um, the, the value that is returned back. The lifetime of the return value, it must exceed the lifetime of the called method. You can't pass back a reference to a variable inside the method because the method's gone. The stack space for that was holding it has been cleaned up and it's gone. So you can't have a reference to something in there, it's gone. So that means that uh, the reference must be to a field or to a, a method argument in the caller um, and it can't be, as I say, a variable inside the called method. Because of the way the compiler rewrites async methods, you can't use unasync methods because the lifetime of an async method is unknown, and so you can't use it there. One of the really useful things of this feature is that modifying the reference, it's the same as modifying the original value because it is the original value. It's a reference, they are sharing the same thing. It's just, um, they're the same object. Uh, and you can do some really interesting things with this. So you can return back a reference to an array element and update it in place, which is kind of crazy. You can say, well, you know, I'll take element 42 out of my array. I'll return that back as a reference. You can modify that because it's, an actual, it's the actual value, uh, and it's, it's updated it in the array without you having to do anything. Normally, you would have to sort of uh, have a getter to get the value out, do some work on it, figure out what the new value is, and a setter to put it back again. This allows you to change things in place, which is very powerful. And again, you know, if you're thinking you've got a massive array, you can just work through that and fix up that array very easily uh, without having to work with the array directly. So the way to work, this, to work with this is you add the ref modifier to the method declaration, to the return type in the method de declaration, and you also add it to the return statement inside the um, declaration. All right, so the next feature then um, works together with this one. It's kind of... Um, You've, you've, you've kind of got to introduce a problem. It's great. I can return back an integer reference, you know, int ampersand if you look at it in IL. But now what do I do with it? How do I use that? Because if I'm returning that back and trying to assign that to a new variable, we already know that assigning a, um, a value type to a value type variable creates a copy. So how do I use this reference? Um, you can't assign, you know, if you had a look at the IL there, you can't assign the int ampersand to an int. They're different types. So you end up with a copy. And so the second feature is a ref local, which is a variable that is a reference to a value type. And, and that's basically how you do it. You, you, de you declare a variable which is a, a reference to a value type. And this allows you to store then the result of a return reference call um, and, uh, and work with it from there. One thing to note which is interesting is that if you're using type inference uh, with var, it's not going to give you 
int reference is going to give you int. Var only matches on the type. It doesn't tell you that it's a reference. So you have to use ref var if you want to use type inference for that. So let's have a quick look at how this works. OK, can everyone see that OK? All right with fonts and things? Magic. So I have, um, I have a value type here, which is just a pointer, a simple 2D point. It's got a float. It's got an x and a y. Everything's public. I can modify anything. Um, it's dead easy and very, very simple. I now have a class which uses this point. It's got a field of point, which I've called location. I can create an instance of my enemy class and uh, pass that into the field. And I have two getters, two get methods. Uh, the first one, get location, this returns back point. Uh, and the second one and then is get location by ref. And you can see, as part of the return type, um, return signature, uh, I'm doing ref return. Sorry, I'm doing ref point. I'm saying that this is going to have a reference return type. And when I use the return keyword, I've got return ref. So I'm going to return this back as a reference. And I've got a bunch of tests now, which we're going to test some assertions with to make sure that this does what we think it's going to do. So first thing I do, I create an instance of my enemy class, which I'm going to be testing, and I pass in a point, which is set to 1010. This gives it a, a value. If I use enemy.getLocation, this is just going to be a point. This is um, not using references at all. It's just passing around value types. It shows that I get a copy back. I get back my copy, which I'm calling location. I set the x value to be 12. And then I can assert that, and it's, it's great. But if I do get location again, I'm getting a new copy, and it's 10. So I haven't changed the value that was in the class itself. So I'm dealing with copies there. So OK, well, let's, let's make use of this new feature, the ref return then, and we will uh, try and make this work. And here again, create a new instance. I call get location by ref, and I assign it to a point. I've got uh, a point value type there. I set the value to x. I can assert that that's correct. But if I get the value from um, the, the class again, it's still 10, because it's a copy. Because when I am creating this variable here, I'm just saying that it's, it's a value type. I'm not saying that it's a reference value type. I'm just saying it's a, re a value. And so it gets a copy. I can do a similar sort of thing here. And I'll get the same problem there. Because I'm using var, I'm using type inferencing. It'll give me a copy. So what I actually need to do is use the ref keyword there and use ref var. And I can now finally get a reference to the actual uh, value that I need, modify that. And I'm modifying the original instance. So if I go and see here. I can assert that location is set to 12. And then if I get location again, it's still set to 12. So there we go. So those are all, all my assertions that the, this should work as expected. And if I just run these tests, we should see that they're all green. Yeah, magic. So everything makes sense. One thing you can do that is really interesting and a bit weird is because I'm returning something back by reference, and it is, that means it's the actual thing, I can now put a method call on the left-hand side of an assignment operation. So I can call enemy get location by ref and set it to a new value like that. And as we see, that, that's green already. So that, that works. But just please don't do this, because it, it hurts my head a little bit. So we'll, we'll sort of skip that one. OK, um, so next, next item then. Oh, too far. There we go. Right, so this is, this is great. We can now sort of return back a value type as a reference and work with it. We've got these reference semantics here. We're not making copies. It's all good and everything. But now I can modify state where I possibly shouldn't be able to modify state. And so the next feature then sort of builds on top of this and gives us a ref read-only return. And uh, here, the, the uh, solution is very simple. We have uh, a, uh, another set of keyword soup, ref read-only var, when we're declaring something. Um, and this allows us to create a uh, reference to a variable type, which we are not allowed to modify. So the compiler will stop us from modifying it. But the compiler does this by um, either a compiler error, which is great, or also by introducing a defensive copy. So you can have copies going on here where you don't see it. And we can have a look at that one as well. So um, again, I have uh, my, uh, my struct, which is a point. I've got public 
fields there, which I can just modify if I want to. I can create a new instance of it. I have a new method here. I've got this translate in place. This mutates its own state. So I can pass in um, changes, and it will change x and y and move itself. It'll change, its, uh, change itself. Basically, I'm saying this is not an immutable point. This is a mutable point. Now, I want to represent uh, the origin of something here. This is going to be a point of 0, 0. And I've got two different ways of doing it here. I can create a static instance here, which is going to be 0, 0. Uh, and I'm using my new ref return there to return back a, um, a reference to this, this point there. That's just written in you know, C sharp property getter syntax there. So despite the ref, it's just a property um, getter. Let's go down there. The second thing I'm doing now, um, the second example I'm using, is a read-only origin, where I'm declaring it as a read-only um, uh, static field. And I've got my getter here written out in full, um, which is going to get public static ref read-only, lots of keywords, throw them all in together, uh, and create a, a property. And I'm using return ref to return a reference to it. So then the things I want to assert on this, the, the things which are, are true about all of this then, is if I use my origin, which is not read-only, and I get it into var, into var then I'm going to get a copy. And uh, if I modify this, if I call, you know, if I uh, change x and everything, I'm working with a copy, so I haven't modified state at all. But if I use ref var on my original one in the same as the, the previous example, I can modify state. And now all of a sudden, I've modified the origin. And if I'm working with a game there, all of a sudden, I've got really weird bugs because 0, 0 no longer is 0, 0. It's moved off in some weird place. So we want to use, uh, we want to assert that this is read only. We want to make sure this is read only. Uh, and so I can use my ref read only var to get at my read only origin. And what is nice here is that we get a compiler error. So we get told uh, straight away. As the tooltip, that uh, we can't modify a struct member here. This is a read-only object there. You're getting it back as a reference, so it's cheap and it's passing things around, um, but we're also asserting that you can't write to it. So that's great. Uh, I can't even compile. We like compiler errors, where, where it forces things on you. Um, but I can do some interesting things, and I can call this translate in place. So I can call my ref read-only object, so I'm going to get this sort of read-only reference to an existing value, and I can still call translate in place on it. And um, I've kind of given the game away now. I was about to say, who thinks this is going to actually work? But um, you can see there from the assertions, um, it still says at 0, 0. Because what happens is we get uh, a call happening on a defensive copy. So the compiler will make a new copy of the value type that we've got, and then call the method on it. So the method happens on a copy, which is then thrown away. And, and that's what Ryder's warning me about here as well. Uh, possibly impure struct method called on read-only variable. So um, the struct value is always copied before invocation. It's quite a wordy way of saying everything I've just said. You've got a defensive copy happening. Your translation doesn't um, mutate anything in place. All right, and so if I just run these tests, everything should be green. All those things should be true. Yay, green. So that's great. That's our sort of um, return values uh, sorted and everything. So we can return a bunch of stuff back. We've got some nice uh, reference semantics going on there. We can pass things around by reference. We can make sure that things don't get um, modified when we don't want them to be, uh, and things are good. What about passing things into methods? Because that's probably more what you're going to be doing with, uh, with, with value types. Uh, and so C Sharp 7.2 introduced in parameters. These kind of complement the out and ref keywords that you've already got. Out means that a value is going to come out. You don't have to do anything to, to pass the value in, whereas ref means I'm passing a value type in, and I'm getting a value type back out again. In is just I'm passing a value type in, passed by reference. Don't make a copy. Use the same thing. Uh, and uh, one thing that the compiler does here is because it's an in parameter, they're just going to say straight away, you can't modify this. This is only about in parameters. It's If you want to change it, use ref, because ref is the actual modifiable one is going both in and out. In is just going in. And so again, the compiler enforces your safety with defensive methods when calling members. And we can quickly look at that. Um, very similar uh, 
pla uh, sorry, struct, um, public fields, translate in place, so it's, it's mutable. Uh, we've got a simple test there to, to prove that it, it does mutate, it does work. Um, but if I even try to uh, create an instance of this, so I've got an in parameter being passed in, and I try and call, you know, change the value of x, I get a compiler error. The compiler's enforcing me, it says you can't do this. But I can still call translate in place, because there's going to be a defensive copy, so something's going to happen, but I'm getting this defensive copy. So compiler error is good, but we've still got that sort of uh, problem going on there. Um, and so we can then also prove that calling the, uh, the method does make a copy there, so if I uh, create a new instance of this, I pass it to my do translate method so I can make use of the in parameter. If I call translate in place, again, Rider is warning me that I'm trying to call a method on something which is going to make a copy and it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. And in fact, it doesn't because instead of setting it to 20, it sets it to, uh, to 10 instead. Uh, interestingly, you can't do crazy things to try and bypass this. So you, could, you can't then pass my in parameter as a reference to something else to try and actually change it as a ref we get a compiler here instead. Uh, sorry, compiler error here instead, where the compiler says basically, nope, it can't be. It's not a real var variable for you to use. And so again, running these tests, we should get a whole bunch of greens, and everything's good. Magic. OK, so that's great. But now we've got a small problem. So we, you know, we, can, we can do a whole bunch of things, and it's really useful, and it's great. But we've got the problem in that calling these methods on these structs is, um, is going to create all these defensive copies. And uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily want all these copies about One of the whole points of doing reference semantics was to avoid these, these cop copies. But the compiler doesn't know if a structs method is going to mutate state. And so another piece of the puzzle is a read-only struct. And basically, this is an immutable struct, and the compiler enforces everything. And uh, you can call any method, and the compiler knows it's not going to change anything, so it avoids the, um, the copies. And this one is really nice to show, because there's basically no tests. There's just compiler errors. So if I, let's go back here. So we, we've got a read-only uh, keyword here um, on the struct. If I take away the, the um, read-only variables, uh, sorry, the read-only modifier on the variables. The compiler gives me warnings and says, you can't do that. Where's the tooltip? Uh, so instance fields of a read-only struct must be read-only. So I can't compile. I have to have those there. And I can't even have my translate in place because, well, ooh. those are compiler errors because, obviously, they're read-only fields. So I can't do anything there. Uh, and so. I can have my ref read-only return back, and I can return it back as uh, a read-only reference. And now, if I use this, I then get back a copy, because it's it's the it's a variable type. I'm assigning it to a value type, sorry, uh, and so I get a copy. But it doesn't matter because the x field is read-only anyway, so I can't modify it. So compiler errors everywhere. This is great. Um, and then using the ref read-only return. Um, it, it's it's read-only. I still can't modify it. So another compiler error. And well, I mean, that method doesn't even exist. So compiler error. So I'm not even going to bother running the tests. So basically, that's great. I can assert and all of these things that I want. I can have reference semantics. I can pass it around without making copies. I can assert that the compiler doesn't generate um, uh, defensive copies for me. And it's all good. And the best thing is, there are no changes to the CLR for this. This has been in the CLR forever. It just hasn't been in C Sharp because it's low-level micro optimizations. Right, one last thing then. One last thing, one little piece of the puzzle there is the idea of a ref struct. This is uh, a bit of a weird thing. It's kind of got very limited use cases, but it is a value type that can only be allocated on the stack. You can't have this as part of a reference type. So if I create a ref struct, I couldn't put it inside my person class. It's, it's illegal. The compiler won't, like, won't let it, which is a, an odd thing. But it, it's, it's OK. You know, why? And the big thing is that it constrains the lifetime of, the, um, uh, of where it can be used there. And it can only be used inside a calling method. Um, so it, there are other constraints as well. So 
uh, I can't box it because it can't live inside a, 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 a non-value type. And because of that, I can't use it with async methods or iterators and also it can't be used as generic parameters. So it's really constrained. There's not a lot of things I can do with this. And it's got very limited use cases, one of which is working with stack alloc memory, which I'm not going to go into. But primarily, it's for span of t. And span of t. Everyone heard of span of t? All right, good, good, good. Um, span of t is a fairly new type, um, although it's probably been a, a year or so at least now, which is designed to unify the way we work with any kind of contiguous memory, any kind of block of memory, like a, a full uh, block of uh, contiguous. How do you define contiguous? Uh, a block, yeah. Um, so that, that's things like arrays and array segments or an array or the chunk of an array. Same with strings and substrings. Native memory as well, so you can use it to uh, represent native memory um, allocated through p invoke type stuff, stack allocated memory, uh, and so on. And it provides an array-like API just indexes to work with that. And there's also a read-only span of T, which provides getters um, only. So you can't actually write to it. You can only uh, read from it. And it's useful because it is type safe. Because it is span of T, each element you get from the indexer is of type T. So it's very much like an array to work with. Uh, and it has array-like performance as well. So it's not quite the same as an array, um, but it is uh, very, very close. And uh, newer frameworks have better support for it, they have uh, special support uh, for it as well. But one of the really nice features of Span is the idea that you can do slicing. So if I have a block of memory, um, I can then sort of say, well, I want this part of a block of memory. Uh, and I can treat that as a subsection of a span uh, by getting a new span, which is just that bit, and there are no allocations. And that's fantastic. That's great for applications such as parsing, for example. if you Parsing, you end up with a big, long string, and you want to get the chunks of that and mo look at the chunks within that string, then this is, this is great. This is a really useful sort of uh, thing to work with. So how does it work? It's a value type. It's a struct. Um, it is implemented uh, for .NET Standard 1.1, which is .NET Framework 4.5 and above. It uses the system memory NuGet package, and that's where you need to use it. Um, it's built into .NET Core 2.1 and above, if I remember rightly. Uh, and it, this, this kind of introduces a bunch of overloads, uh, sorry, APIs and overloads into the base class library for working with, um, with, with things as spans. And this, these APIs then have sort of significant usage of some of the reference semantic stuff, which I've just been uh, talking about. So you get a lot of things happening allocation free. There are a couple of types. You've got span of T, read only span of T. There's also memory of T, which I'm going to leave as an exercise to the viewer to look that one up. That one's a bit crazy. Um, and then there are two different versions as well, depending on the runtime you're supporting. You've got a portable version, as it's called, and a fast version. Um, the portable uh, version is for older versions of the framework, don't stand 1.1 and above. It's not slow. It's not a fast version and a slow version, um, but it's not as fast as arrays. The way this one is implemented is it has three fields. It has an object reference, so here's my block of memory. It has an internal offset of where it's going to start with inside the block of memory, and then the length to tell you which subsection of that block of memory you're working with. So three fields makes it slightly larger than the, the, the fast version. And getting to a particular element within that uh, subsection is slightly more complex. The fast implementation requires uh, runtime support, and that's been available since .NET Core 2.1 and above. And it only has two fields. There's a an internal pointer. So where you've got your big block of memory, instead of having a pointer to the start and the offset, you have a pointer straight to there. And then you have the length. So you have two fields, and it then gives you the information you need. There are specific JIT optimizations in there, so you can it removes some of the bounds check in the loops, giving you more array-like performance. And so what does this have to do with ref struct that I've just been talking about? Well, you've got multiple fields in there for thread safety. You kind of have to update everything all at once. So uh, you know, if you updated one thing and then another, you, uh, if you updated one field, it had a thread switch, and then you wanted to update the other, the other one, you can't guarantee that that's OK. You can't put a lock around it because the whole point is performance, and that, would, that ruins it, and it's, it's no good. These internal pointers for the fast version, they require extra uh, tracking from the garbage collector, which is expensive, so you don't want to have too many of those happening at once. And if you want span to represent stack-allocated memory, 
how does that work if span is on the heap? So make span a ref struct. It can only be created on the stack. That constrains the lifetime. It can only be used by a single thread, so you don't need locking. And it solves all the problems. Right, I've got 42 seconds. But this is uh, fairly nice and straightforward. I've got a string and uh, an array of numbers. And I can just use string dot as span. And I can just use this as you'd expect. Span dot length is the same as my string dot length. I can do span dot equals. I can even do span dot starts with. So there are helper methods on top of span, which will do allocation free um, checking of, uh, uh, of string equality. I can then do something like slice of six to get a small subset of my uh, string out. And again, I can do length and equality checking, and all is good. I can look at my numbers array, and I can get a subsection of my numbers array as a mutable span. So it's a span of int, not a read-only span of int. And I can change one of the values. And I can assert there that it's, it's actually changed. Uh, and the best thing of all is ignore the crazy stuff that's happening in there. I can run those, and it's all allocation free. So if I run this, I'm going to get green lights, uh, especially out of this allocation free one. All right, that's all green already. Allocation free um, uh, method there, which calls all the other tests and then asserts that the um, the, the the code is is uh, didn't allocate any memory. Uh, and that then brings me to the, the last slide, then, which is a bunch of links. There's some really useful um, documents uh, on here. There, there's uh, the documentation itself for reference semantics is really useful. Uh, there's a very good video there, a span of T. Uh, there's a very good blog post by a uh, friend of the show, uh, Adam. And um, also a couple of posts there, one which explains some of the optimizations that span of T has, which gives it the array-like performance. Uh, and also then uh, the link from earlier on about value task, which is really uh, useful um, for working with uh, and avoiding allocations with async await. And um, I think that is me done. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Matt, we still have time for one question. We will have 15 minutes break, so don't worry. Uh, do we have any question from the audience right now? So let's ask one or two questions, and then we'll, we'll have 15 minutes break. Hello. Hi. Uh, in the, as I saw the... Thanks. Uh, as I saw the read only struct uh, in in there, it reminded me of uh, uh, struct in C++ with all the all all the methods uh, constant. Do you think that there is a certain uh, trend in uh, in uh, C sharp and .NET as well to m move towards this trend, like to mark not only the whole struct but also some just some methods of it read only and uh, stuff like that? Um, I don't think you need to uh, mark all methods as read-only or as const like you do in C++ because um, when you have uh, a read-only struct, all your fields are read-only, so it is automatically a const method. It's all automatically a pure method. It can't modify itself. It can return back a new instance, but um, it, it, I don't think it'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to mark any methods to do that. Yeah, uh, right. Right now it doesn't. But if you if you think that it might be in the in the future become can become my more fine grain it like uh, that uh, under that uh, you would have a normal struct with just read that you, you would just mark some methods and read only and those methods wouldn't then cause the the usage of the uh, of the of the defensive copy when when called. Um. So yes, basically you can already do that. So there ah. is. Uh, there is a pure attribute defined in. Uh, the, the, that might not be the one I'm thinking of, but there, there is, Microsoft, uh, I'm pretty sure, has had a con, uh, an attribute for several years where you can mark something as pure, and that gives you a hint to whatever tooling that this method does not modify internal state. And so you can already do that, um, but it's not asserted anywhere. Uh, Resharper and Rider will uh, take advantage of this. They will, they will look at this value here. And so if you call the method and ignore the return type, it'll say, well, what's the point of calling that? It doesn't change any state, and you've forgotten the return type. So uh, you can already do that kind of thing. I don't expect it to go any further than, than an attribute like that.
Okay, but it doesn't prevent from the creation of the defensive copy, right, in the case of the ref, ref struct. Uh, yeah, so in fact, if I uh, went back to um, where I translate in place, so I've got the warning here for translate in place. If I put pure on the top there, why is that giving me an error? Fine. Uh, okay, anyway, so the, the if we have any gone. further questions, uh, Matt will be happy to answer them uh, during the break. Yes. All right? Yep. Ladies oh, and, and gentlemen, Matt Ellis, one more time, applause. <laughs>